Our next session, which will last for about one and a half hour, is the special dis panel discussion on sustainable economic recovery and development in Thailand. As we are arranging the seating for our panelists, I'd like to indulge a bit in introducing them. In fact, none of them needs introduction. Uh, I would like to call them as, as titans in Thailand's economic, financial, and trade policy. And um, they're all very accomplished scholars and policymakers. They are Dr. Viratai Santiprapop, Dr. Subhavut Saichua, and Dr. Somkiat Tangkitwanit. We have, let me continue by introducing you to the first panelist, um, Dr. Viratai Santiprapop. He's a former governor of the Bank of Thailand, where he completed his tenure just two years ago. He has also held numerous positions in both public and private sectors, having provided expertise and leadership in macroeconomics, energy, medical services, development, especially sustainable development, and digital and financial systems and ecosystems. At places like the Bank of International Settlements, the Stock Exchange of Thailand, PTTEP, the World Food Program, and Ma Fa Luang Foundation, among so many others. He holds a PhD from Harvard and prestigious fellowships, including the US Eisenhower and Singapore's S.R. Nathan, among other awards. Our second panelist is Dr. Supavut Saichua, currently advisor to Thailand's leading financial group, Kietnakin Patra, and respected lecturer and speaker, including here at the Foreign Ministry. Um, especially here at this diplomatic school itself. Dr. Superwood has been widely consulted by the government agencies on economic policy, uh, thanks to his over 30 years experience at Patra Securities. He was also a former diplomat um, in Washington, D.C., and took part in the WTO's Uruguay round of trade negotiations under the GATT framework. He received his PhD from University of Hawaii at, at Manoa. Our third panelist is Dr. Somkiat Tangkitwanit, president of the Thailand Development Research Institute, or TDRI, arguably the country's best economic think tank. He obtained his PhD in computer science from Tokyo Institute of Technology. A long time leading specialist on trade and investment, innovation, education, intellectual property, ICT, and the media, and of course, the political economy of these issues. Dr. Sumkiat was also behind the birth of Thai PBS, the region's first public TV, and the author of so many media laws in Thailand. I remember reading his works on telecom privatization and corporatization as a student. Allow me the, stu uh, the honor of giving the floor to our th these three titans. Please, thank you. Uh, this may be a little strange, but our uh, Stage is the stage is slightly small, so uh, I will moderate from the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think the uh, subject that uh, we have chosen for uh, discussion today as part of our official opening is sustainable Thailand, because I think this is something uh, that has been discussed quite widely in recent uh, months uh, due to uh, we coming out of the uh, COVID-19, and uh, I think uh, we, we would like to hear the assessment of our panelists uh, and um, uh, their views on uh, what we should do to go forward, uh, considering the, um, uh, that the pandemic is still with us to a certain extent. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are also other uh, global uh, issues that we have to take into consideration uh, because uh, uh, they have affected the economic development around the world, uh, in particular the uh, conflict between, uh, in Europe between Russia and the Ukraine, the geopolitical competition between the uh, superpowers, uh, and uh, also the threat from uh, climate change and how uh, the uh, low carbon society uh, should be developed and uh, the model of the bio circular and green economy could help uh, in, in this uh, development. 
And uh, also, uh, looking ahead uh, in a few months, Thailand will host the APEC summit. So our role in international economic uh, cooperation is also something that uh, is very important and we should uh, examine that. So with these uh, uh, ideas floating around, uh, I would like to uh, invite our panelists to uh, add their views, uh, share their views with us uh, on these issues. Uh, I, I think each will be uh, given 15, 20 minutes, uh, and then uh, we will listen to them again, and then we will open the floor to uh, questions and uh, sharing of uh, opinions. So with that, uh, could I start with uh, Dr. Viratai, please? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Anuson, Excellencies. I'm uh, very delighted to, uh, to be part of this, this discussions today. Um, Dr. Anuson has given a very broad question, a very broad range of topics to cover uh, before you know, I try to answer what we should do. Uh, perhaps allow me to provide some, some, uh, some context as to how I see the world is developing. Um, as, as we often say, you know, the, the, the global economy has been in a state of VUCA, you know, highly volatile, uncertain, complex, and also ambiguous. And it's becoming more and more VUCA as, as time goes by, particularly after the, 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 the three C conflicts, um, you know, crisis because of the COVID and also from the global financial crisis, the COVID pandemic, and also the climate change. Thailand being a small open economy, uh, basically, um, we dictated or be highly influenced by, by global economic developments. And also there's some Thai specific factors that also contribute to, to the challenges ahead. Um, it, in my view, there are four reinforcing forces um, interacting among themselves that, that lead to this, this stage of VUCA, VUCA world. And, and allow me to, to spend some time talking about these four reinforcing forces. Um, to provide some, some framework as to how we see the world moving ahead. Um, the, the, first, the, first, the first force is related to the unwinding of economic recovery policies from the global financial crisis, particularly when you look at, look at um, the stage of monetary policies. Um, you know, since the global financial crisis, uh, we had a long decade of very low interest rates, indeed, you know, negative interest rates in, 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 in Europe. So monetary policy easing and has created excess liquidity in the global, in the global economy, uh, leading to a lot, of, a lot of unintended consequences, as, as, as we see today, uh, be it you know, asset price bubble, um, the, the debt crisis in frontier markets, emerging markets, um, high degree of leverage in the corporate sector and also in, 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 in households. Um, given a long, a long period of, of um, very easy monetary policies and we had, we had COVID pandemic, uh, during the, 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 the COVID uh, pandemic, most countries also step up their, their, their stimulus efforts through monetary policies and also through fiscal policy that contributed to the delay of normalization of monetary policy. And indeed, you know, many central banks, including the Bank of Thailand, had to reverse the cost of monetary policy normalization. And, and most countries also had to, had to use a lot of fiscal stimulus to help you know, uh, basically shoulder the effects of, of, of the pandemic. Uh, but now, given that the, the, the pandemic is is, 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 has been brought under control, and, and we see the magnitude of the unintended consequences of all these easing policies, uh, the world is moving in, in, in another direction. Uh, we would expect to see normalizations or unwinding of, of policies to stimulate economic recovery. And um, the, 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 the segment of the, the, the global economy that we see affects the most is the capital market and financial markets. You see volatility in stock prices, in exchange rates. So that's, that's the, first, the first force that is, that is, that is being played. The, the, second, the, second, the second force, in my view, is very much related 
to the effects of the COVID pandemic. I would like to call it the, the equilibrating force. You know, uh, the world's most of the sectors, in my view, were in were in some forms of equilibrium, and then the COVID pandemic hit, and creating a lot of bottlenecks, a lot of disruptions, a lot of lockdown, and in in many in many sectors. You know, um, for, for instance, if you may recall, um, about a year and a half ago, um, when there were lockdowns in, 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 in many advanced economies, there was a big shift from, from, consumption, from service sectors to consumption. Basically, you know, most people had to stay at home. They could not go out to eat out at restaurants. They could not travel. So a lot of expenditures were shifted from, from, from the service sector. To, 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 cons to consumptions, to purchases of goods, and, and, and mainly that contributed to you know, the, the, the lack of logistic cap capacity, you know, the long delay in, in, in shipments. And on top of that, we also had a lot of lockdown, um, lockdown that contributed to, to shortage of goods, you know, short factory, um, fa factory closure. And whenever there is a, there is a shortage of supply, there is also artificial demand, right? When people started stockpiling goods, um, that that also led to led, led to led to even more bottleneck. But now, the COVID has been brought under control. We we seeing um, consumptions is being shifted away from from goods to services. So you see congestions at airports. Um, airline capacities can't cope up with the demand for for for, for travel. So this this is an example of. Of of equilibrating, you know, a new equilibrium is being is 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 being is 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 is, is, um, is being discovered, and a lot of a, a lot of um, firms and also many sectors will require some time to to to, to adjust, so that the world will be in, in the equilibrium stage again. The other sector that we can see clearly is energy sector, when we had lockdown, a sharp decline in economic activities. The, the price of oil, the global price of oil came down sharply about two years ago, and that led to very low investment in, in energy production and, and exploration. Uh, but now we have, we have problems of uh, not enough uh, supply, and, and on top of that we have, we have this, 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 this conflict um, in, in, in Europe contributing to, to even uh, further shortage of supplies. Um, and, and the world has very little, little, little buffer and there are many, many sectors that you know, one, one can think about that are in the process of re-equilibrating uh, themselves. So when, 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 we, when we see this, this demand and supply forces uh, trying to find, find new equilibrium, um, there, are a lot of, there could be a lot of volatility in the economic cycles. Um, the up cycle for some sectors could be, could be short-lived. Um, and because of the, particularly because of the artificial uh, demand, uh, the, the, need, the need to create buffers or the need to, to build up inventory. Uh, and in some sectors, excess supply, they had excess supply even before the COVID uh, pandemic arrived, and that would require consolidation. And in the process of finding a new equilibrium that, that requires a lot of transitions, requires a lot of adjustments, and obviously the weaker ones will be squeezed out, particularly the small and medium enterprises. Uh, that they get squeezed out along the way. So we should expect the, the industrial structure, the market structure of some sectors to change towards oligopoly structure because the, the stronger ones, the bigger ones, will be able to, to, um, to, to, to survive the, the, the crisis. And the, throughout, during the process, they can also have opportunities to acquire and integrate uh, smaller ones. So, so this short-term equilibrating impact could also have long-term implications when we look at the industrial structure. The, the third uh, force that is uh, being played out in, in my view, I would call it the rebalancing force. Um, you know, even before COVID pandemic arrived, there, there were some some matters were in need of rebalancing even before that, but you know the problems got magnified. Uh, during the COVID pandemic. And the first one is about inequality, um, particularly in, in a country like, like Thailand. When you look at the, the disparity in income, disparity in wealth, and, and most importantly in my view is the, is the inequality in access to opportunity. 
and, and that, that, that was a challenge before COVID, but during the COVID pandemic, obviously the small, small people, the people at the bottom of the pyramids, they, they got hit the most. And that even you know, magnify the, 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 the problems of inequality, disparity that, that we have to deal with. The other issue is about the role of the states. Um, if you may recall, pre-COVID, um, people were talking about you know, anti-establishment as being played out in political landscapes in, 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 in many countries. Even in my, in my area of central banking, you know, the cryptocurrencies, distributed ledger technologies, uh, people were searching for, for new ways of bypassing the established institution and moving away from the centralized control into some form of distributed platform-based environment. Um, but during the COVID pandemic, um, the state indeed um, had more control, particularly through the power to deal with the COVID pandemic through you know, vaccination programs, lockdown order, and, and also um, um, quite, quite a number of of, of policies that has distributional impacts. So this would require some forms of liberalizing um, post, post COVID pandemic. And as, as we see in, in, in Thailand, another issue is, is about intergenerational gaps. Um, you know, the, the lack of understandings between the new generations and the not so new generations and, and that have contributed to, to a lot of, of conflicts. Um, these, these are issues that, 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 that are also you know, in the process of fighting, fighting a, new, a, a, new, a new balance. And, and the, last, the last force that, that, is, that is being played out, um, in, in my view, this is the most important one, is the need for, for reform to, be cut, to, uh, to, to deal with the irreversible changes. The, the first three forces being you know, the, um, the unwinding of economic recovery, um, the, the equilibrating or rebalancing, those, those could, be, could be reversed, could, could come back to, to an equilibrium stage. But, but the last category of force, in my view, uh, this has gone over the tipping points and won't be able to come back to, to, the, to the previous equilibrium or to a new equilibrium easily. And, and there are three, three irreversible changes um, that will have significant impacts for a country like Thailand. Um, one is on demographic change. Um, as, as you know, um, Thailand is an aging society and will soon become a super aged society. Um, by being an aging society, obviously, that has implications for the size of the workforce, the size of the market, and also um, the rising expenditures of, of the government, they put a lot of pressure on, on, on the fiscal budget. It, we also have a lot of implications on the political landscape when uh, you know, large constituencies are old people, aging people trying to protect the you know, status quo, basically, particularly on the welfare benefits, why we have the new generations who are trying to, to, to argue for, for changes to be able to, 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 um, to move ahead with, with the new, new global environment. So this demographic change is, 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 a, is a key trend that, 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 that we can't ignore. Uh, the second, the second um, change that is irreversible is technological change, technology disruption. We have seen rapid technology advancements in, in all sectors, in all fields, being you know, digital technology, 3D printing, um, medical technology, health science. And, and these, these new technologies will, will change the way we conduct business, that will change the way we even conduct our, our, our lifestyles. Um, many, many sectors have already started to change, and, but, you know, and, but the change will, will continue, as we see clearly in, in the ecosystem of electronic payments in Thailand, you know, digital banking, digital financial services, retail sector has also changed significantly. And we will be moving more towards what I would call the platform-based society, platform-based economy uh, with decentralized architecture as opposed to a control and hierarchical architecture that, that we used to. And, and the third one that is irreversible is a climate crisis. Um, the impact will become 
stronger and stronger every year all over the world from what we have seen with you know, the humidity, the heat, the rain intensity. Um, net zero commitment uh, will, will, uh, will be very challenging, will be a very big task for, for any government. It requires very comprehensive and decisive uh, policy execution and also coordination across, across, across um, different, different segments of the societies. There will be many new standards that would govern trade, govern investments, that related to, 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 um, to low carbon uh, movements. Um, on one hand, you know, the challenge would be on moving towards a low carbon, trying to mitigate the impact of the climate change. But for a country like Thailand, um, that depends a lot on agricultural sector and tourism sector, that de also depends on, it depends on the, 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 the climate, um, the implications from, from, from the climate change. Adaptation is, in my view, could be even more important than mitigation, and we haven't done much on, on creating plans to adapt to the new world with, 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 uh, with, with, climate, with, with climate crisis. Um, so these are the four reinforcing forces that, that are, are at play now um, post-COVID post pandemic. For, for Thailand, um, and more concerns with the implications from the rebalancing forces the third one, and the needs for reform to deal with, with irreversible changes, the, the fourth one. And, and this will have implications for the medium, medium to long term. Um, but we need, we need immediate, we need policies immediately now to be able to, 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 to respond to these medium to, to longer term uh, challenges. Um, for, for, for the first and the second one, the, the effects of the unwinding of you know, economic recovery policies globally and also the, the, the equilibrating of many segments. I'm, 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 less, I'm, less, I'm less concerned um, you know, because I believe that in the short term we continue to have some, some good buffers to, to deal with those challenges. Um, if you look at the size of foreign debt of Thailand, it's, it's very small. Um, we have depended very little on, on foreign financing and we have very large international reserves. So that's a huge buffer against volatility, uh, and unlike many other emerging markets. Um, we have no issues about food security, Thailand being a food exporting country. Um, our banking sectors uh, are very sound and, and continues to be, we continue to be very strong. And um, you know, post-COVID pandemic, um, we will benefit from the recovery of the tourism sector and the, and the agricultural prices. So in the short term, um, I'm, not, I'm not very concerned, but I'm more concerned about the long-term forces. I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir uh, Thai. I think the, he has already painted uh, uh, sort of um, the canvas to show the, all the major sort of macro issues that uh, we need to, to tackle uh, and, and how um, uh, we, we're going to lead ourselves into the uh, world post-COVID. So next, uh, can I invite a view from uh, someone who's uh, more uh, in tune with the private sector? Uh, Dr. Superwood, maybe you'd like to share your views, please. Uh, th thank you very much, and uh, I'm very, very glad to be here. I, I think um, I, I am probably uh, the oldest person, uh, among oldest person in this room, so I, I like to take us back, if you will. Um, first of all, looking at the global economy, I, I would argue that the global economy in the past 50 years, 60 years have seen steady fall in inflation. If you look back to the 1980s, um, the world was trying to get away from uh, OPEC oil, and we were exploring uh, for gas and other uh, energy alternatives everywhere. OPEC, if I remember correctly, back in the 70s had a 60% market share of oil. Now it's down closer to about 30, 40%, even with OPEC plus. So um, that's how inflation came down. Of course, um, Paul Volcker tightened monetary policy hugely uh, in uh, 1980. Uh, following that decade, which uh, benefited Thailand too, because they also came exploring for gas in Thailand and found natural gas in the Gulf of Thailand. 1990s was a year, was the times in which, of course, if you remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, 
um, integration of a lot of Eastern European countries into the capitalist system also helped augment production and uh, economic growth. So again, 1990s, very good times. 2001, President Clinton brought China into the WTO. Again, huge gain to the global economy in terms of production, lower prices, and of course, integration of the global supply chain. Um, I think um, 2008, 2009, uh, the great financial crisis, that financial um, breakdown in the US which affected the world, if you will, also was a major force in deflationary, causing infl deflationary impacts throughout the past decade. So again, you've had, you know, we've had a long 50, 60 year time in which inflation kept falling. And I think, you know, we're starting to be, to think that that must be the reality going forward. Uh, now, I, I put a question mark on this one. Going forward, will that continue to be the case? Um, it is true that where, what we have today, uh, I would argue that the fiscal balance of most governments in the world are not in a good shape. We've all been spending a lot of money to, to help our, our population from COVID. So government debt, high. Therefore, fiscal policy stimulus going forward, probably not that strong. Monetary policy, on the other hand, has to deal with inflation that we see right now. So we're going to go into rough times going into the next couple of years. The US, strongest economy, but they could overdo it. The Fed could over tighten and get uh, the US into recession according to the market around the middle of next year or later. Uh, Euro Europe is probably in recession now and might have to endure this according to the Economist Intelligence Unit all the way through to 2020, early 2024. So rough times ahead, um, but what is interesting in my view is what then in the next three, four, five years do we get a lot of inflation? Maybe because of uh, climate change and the need to um, reduce carbon emissions and use more expensive types of fuel. The U Europe has to, of course, uh, reduce dependency on Russia. And the global supply chain is splitting up, right? US-China rivalry in, tech, in, uh, in semiconductors. It's not only in semiconductors, it's probably in other things too. So this integration this supply chain which had kept uh, prices low um, might not be the case in the next three, four, five years. So you might have a situation where the world cannot have um, its cake and eat it too, low inflation and high growth at the same time. That is the, um, I think, international environment that we'll have to deal with going forward. I hope I'm wrong if um, it all goes well and you have uh, nice uh, technological innovations continuing and low inflation, well and good. But I, I put a question mark here. Thailand, okay. Uh, again, very broad brush. 60s, we were doing uh, import substitution industrialization, which didn't work, so we decided in the 70s, let's do export-led growth, which was good, but when um, um, global inflation was very high. We also suffered setbacks. 1980s was a good time for Thailand because they found natural gas. And we were able to basically have cheap energy, and we already at that time had cheap labor. All we had to do was to execute a good um, industrial estate plan at Mabdaput, bring the gas on, onshore, and then we could build a petrochemical industry. Uh, the Japanese needed to um, um, invest abroad, so they came to Thailand, set up an automobile industry. Mainly we were producers of car parts, and you know, that's how we, we developed very well. Um, we made missteps in the 1990s. We thought that we could, do, we could become a uh, 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 financial center. We um, could not be a financial center. Then 2000, we recovered. And when I went back and looked at the data, tourism started to accelerate from about 2005. If you look back, you can see that the data just telling you that this, is the en this was the engine of growth for about probably close to 15 years. 
Now, today, post-COVID, what do we do? I, I think that, that's something that still perplexes me. Um, I haven't figured it out, but it looks to me like we have to reinvent ourselves. But, but even that, even before COVID, we were talking about Thailand worried about being trapped in the middle income uh, segment of the global economy. And um, I think that worry probably was uh, not incorrect. I went back and looked. Thailand's uh, able ability to attract FDI um, had always been quite good until 2014, when from that day on, FDI coming to Thailand was less than that going to Vietnam. And since, the, the gap has widened. So number one, we've um, probably lost the ability to attract uh, high quality capital the way we did before compared to our rivals. Now, that's important. Uh, to me, uh, capital is important um, because it's investment. Foreign direct capital is even more important because it's probably augmented with good technology, high quality, uh, new management skills, and so on. Couple that with um, uh, us running out of gas, needing more expensive uh, liquefied natural gas, uh, depending on gas from uh, Myanmar. Um, and you put a, another question mark on another key factor of production, energy. The third factor Dr. Viratai mentioned was labor. We're going to run out of labor. So, so to me, looking forward, I, um, I must admit that I don't subscribe in the long term to the C plus I plus T plus X minus M uh, model. That's a Keynesian short term model. Long term, it must always be in the factors of production. Capital and technology, energy, and labor. And unfortunately, on all three counts, we need to really get our act together. Now, knowing how to develop these uh, factors of production is one issue. The other issue is, of course, what to produce. What are we good at? What are we good at? Um, I saw a, um, a news item where uh, Thailand supposedly wants to declare itself to be a a, um, a superpower in, on, on, on food, and um, I cannot agree that we are um, at that stage. So I went back and looked. Thailand's agriculture output was valued at 43 billion US dollars. Japan's was 50 billion. We used 12.7 million workers. The Japanese used 2.1 million workers. And of course, land area, we use 105 million rai. They use 26 million rai. So while we do have comparative advantage in, in agricultural production, we are a net exporter of food, we are under-investing. We are under-applying technology into agriculture. I would argue that the path forward for Thailand must be a more diligent, deliberate, focused uh, application of um, technology and investment in agriculture. That seems to me to be quite obvious going forward. Now, how do we do that properly? I guess that's something that you, you really have to think about because as we all know, right, we, um, we have maybe 30% of the labor force engaged in agriculture or close to that, but producing only less than 10% of GDP. Clearly, um, we need to do that. Uh, my, uh, my company, Gernakin Patara, we um, did a short uh, paper, and we found, for example, that this year, this year, um, while farmers' income will go up, their profits will not, because uh, fertilizer's price went up three times, and rice price hasn't gone up three times. And in fact, um, some farmers will, will, from becoming profitable, will actually be losing money. Again, um, while we are good in producing food, we, as you know, we produce um, only 5% of the fertilizers that we use today. Now, do we want more fertilizers? Um, maybe not, because these are chemical fertilizers that do affect the environment. So, I don't want to go too deep into a particular area, but it seems to me that this is one obvious area. Um, 
And then you have to ask yourself also, do we want to continue to do industries like um, automobiles when you have uh, electric vehicles which need much fewer components and we are actually parts producers? Or do you want to do something else? Can we try to do um, strategic industries like semiconductors? But that would require huge investment in terms of manpower and the um, environment in which um, a, uh, uh, a semiconductor foundry can operate. Good water supply, good electricity. Again, something to think about going forward. Um, another example. And finally, my, my thoughts are, um, we seem to be have a, a natural um, ability to, to do high-touch industries like tourism. Can we move up the, the ladder and do uh, medical tourism? Uh, would, would, uh, which is the way, we, the way we're doing it. Is we, I think we are moving in that direction a little bit because we're talking about easing requ visa requirements. But I would thought that we would have to be more proactive than just to say, okay, you can come to Thailand more easily. Let's see what we could do to make Thailand even more attractive, more livable for foreigners who want to come um, and, yeah, and enjoy uh, the lifestyle here. Thank you very much. Let me stop here. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Superwood. I think you have raised a lot of questions, uh, and um, I'm not sure who's going to be providing the answers. <laughs> um, uh, would Dr. Sobkiet be providing the answers? Please, Dr. Sobkiet. Um, I, will, I will answer some of the easy, quest, easy questions, but I will leave difficult ones to Dr. Wiratai. I think he's more capable than I do on this kind of issue. So thank you so much for the ISC for inviting he, me to be here, especially um, um, Ambassador Anuson, who is always very kind to me. Um, I'm um, happy to be on the panel with these two distinguished uh, economists. Um, I will start uh, my um, discussions by agreeing with a lot of, uh, on a number of issues the two previous speakers has talked about. And that's quite a shame. I would like to be, um, I would like the session to be more controversial so that we can discuss a lot. But it turned out I, I, I agree quite a lot with both of them. First of all, my first point, I, I agree a lot with Dr. Wiratai that I'm not really worried about a short-term kind of issue. I think Thailand is really good at um, a number of things. Uh, first of all, macroeconomic uh, management. As you can see, we have passed through um, the COVID crisis, the, um, the high inflation in United States and developed countries without uh, much injury. I, I think that's because we have very strong foundation for macroeconomic um, policy management by the Bank of Thailand and also by the Ministry of, Foreign, uh, Ministry of uh, Finance. Um, that's what we are good at. Um, and also we are relatively good at healthcare policy. So that's the reason why we can pass through the COVID uh, crisis relatively um, uh, un unscathed. Uh, even though um, there are certainly uh, there are a lot of suffering, but we are not um, in the in any sense uh, going to collapse. So um, that's what we are good at, and and by that we have been uh, develop our economy to be a higher middle income country. Um, and our next um, development challenges are threefold. First of all, we would like to grow faster in order to cope with um, the aging society issue uh, that needs pension, more healthcare expenditure. We need to save up um, some of our money to prepare for that. And we are not growing fast enough. Even though we have not um, running into crisis like um, Laos or Sri Lanka, uh, we are having difficulties growing to match the level of um, the pre-COVID uh, level. Um, it will be another year to reach that level. And looking forward, um, the, the long-run economic growth of Thailand will be um, pretty low by this uh, region standard, by around 3% per annum. Um, if you look at um, our neighboring countries, it will be 5%, 6%, 7%. So Thailand is losing its luster in terms of um, growth dynam dynamism. Secondly, we are really highly unequal society, and that creates a lot of problems politically, economically. Uh, and lastly, we are not really sustainable at the moment. And this is our three developmental objectives, um, which, are, which has not been achieved yet, and it will become a kind of structural problem that Thailand needs to solve. 
Now, my second point is that um, I, I totally agree with Dr. Vidithai again that we are facing a kind of uh, disruptive forces, the four or five forces, um, certainly uh, beginning with um, the demographic change, um, technological change, uh, technological disruption, geopolitics, and also climate change. And all these forces will um, make the problem of development in Thailand uh, becoming much more difficult. For example, with demographic change, um, the growth rate cannot be raised higher and, uh, unless we do something rather radical. Technology change as well makes our production technology quite obsolete. And we, if you look at the development in disruptive technology, AI to begin with, AI has been uh, progressing at a very breakneck speed. Uh, Ten years ago, um, there was a kind of um, AI breakthrough by deep learning, and we have a chess program, um, Go program, that outbeat a uh, human champion. That was 10 years ago, but now, this year, there are so-called generative AI models that are uh, one million times more complex than those of 10 years ago model. And it will change a lot unless um, we can really prepare for that. And if you look at the Thai AI master plan, it was designed to meet um, the challenge of 10 years ago, just approved by the cabinet uh, a few months ago. So you can see the, the magnitude of the challenge technologically. And also geopolitics. Geopolitics used to work for the benefit of Thailand um, during the time that Japan uh, rose to challenge the U.S. And as a result, there was a Prasa Accord that um, made the geopolitical situation in the world um, really different. And at the time, Thailand was able to attract investment from Japan and from the so-called NIS, NIS, the newly industrialized economies, Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong. Now, similar things happen. China has risen to challenge the United States, and there are trade conflict, technology conflict. And companies in, Tha in China, um, whether they are Chinese, Taiwanese, uh, US, European, Japanese, they have to relocate to somewhere. And Thailand happened to be not the first choice as used to be in the past. We are the second or third choice, um, followed by um, um, after um, Vietnam, which has more demographic um, um, ben benefit. And climate change will aggravate our development model um, as we rely a lot, as Dr. Sabut has mentioned, agriculture. And our agricultural um, development has been quite outmoded. We rely quite a lot on rainwater, which is becoming more uh, fluctuating. And it's hard uh, to grow uh, crops with high yields unless you have enough water. And global climate change will make water shortages. And that's the point that Thailand has not um, been prepared uh, for yet. So um, the four forces will make the development of Thailand even more challenging. And we are not really prepared for that, and that's the structural problem that I'm really worried about, and I'm sure Dr. Vida Thai probably share the same uh, worry, that we are not worried about the short term, but the more structural one. Um, the reason that we are not really well prepared to cope with all these challenges is due to the structural problem that Dr. Subhut mentioned, the factor of production kind of thing, beginning with labor quality, beginning with investment, technology, innovation, and lastly, uh, institution or governance structure of the country. So it's really easy to see the solution out, but how to implement that is quite an, another issue. It's really straightforward that Thailand should adapt to the new uh, global landscape by doing a number of things. First of all, making ourselves leaner and cleaner. Leaner in terms of when you produce something, use less energy, um, use less materials, and become greener at the same time, use renewable energy. And also by saving energy, saving materials, we, are, we, we will be by definition greener as well. And these kind of things are not, are not out of reach. Um, the Thai companies in Thailand have already mastered certain kinds of lean production system, transferred by Japanese companies in the past uh, investment. Um, um, cycle. Um, for example, companies in the car production, electronic production, 
have mastered all this and even transfer this kind of know-how to service um, companies. For example, Sililaj Hospital, a non-profit um, hospital, has received a Diamond uh, Lean Award from the Prime Minister very recently by adopting you know, car production uh, lean technology. So we have more or less mastered this kind of technology, but we have to step up to another level. That's the first thing we need to do, make ourselves leaner and cleaner. Secondly, we need to automate ourselves using robots, using AI software. In the factory, we have to use more robots. In the warehouse, which are really labor intensive, we have to use warehouse automation. And also in the office, we have to use um, robotic process automation, RPA, these kind of things to improve our productivity because we are no longer labor abundant. abundant. We have to um, increase labor productivity by adopting more uh, automation and AI types of technology. And thirdly, we have to be more innovative um, by investing in new, new kinds of production, new kinds of technology. Thailand has invested quite a lot, um, has increased in its investment in research and development um, during the past decade from around 0.25% um, uh, of our GDP to over 1% of our GDP for uh, a few years already. But that um, cannot be compared with the investment level of Korea. For example, Korea invested 4% um, of its uh, GDP in R&D, Japan around 3% or something like that, and has invested at this level for decades. So we have to catch up. And this is um, an issue that um, the Thai government has to put a lot of effort. And fourthly, um, without regulatory reform or governance reform, we will not be able to achieve the above. For example, if we would like to upgrade our skill of, of our labor, education will be a bottleneck. So this is an, an example. If we, like to, if we would like to uh, make our um, innovation more productive. The Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation have to be uh, enormously uh, re reformed to be more demand driven, to be um, more responsive to the market force. So um, regulations have to be um, revised wholesale. So that's, that's the challenge that the Thai government and the Thai society um, need, need to do. Now, my last point before I finish. What about, what, what does um, foreign policy have to do with all this? I will briefly um, mention the political economy dimension of our development problem. Uh, we know what we would like to do, and I think the government totally agree with me. The NSDC, the planning agency, totally agree with what I say. But how to move Thailand forward? That's the developmental dilemma. It's politics. It's not economics. Pol politics is much more difficult than economics, I'm sure. Economics, economics even though uh, people from, from time to time say that they don't like economics because um, they would like to have one definite answer, not one on one hand, on the other hand. But on this kind of developmental issue, I think all economists agree more or less with each other. But how to move the things forward, I think, is the political problem. And it seems that we have been trying to reform for quite some time without much uh, significant progress. The problem is certainly politics. And I think in this dimension that we need foreign dimension, international policy, to commit ourselves. Trade negotiation has been a taboo in Thailand, especially with big ones. Thailand could not join the CPTPP, could not join uh, European Thailand FTA because the standard is too high. So I think Thailand needs to find some other forum. And I think the uh, membership of the OECD, um, which is not a trade deal, but a kind of developmental deal, would make Thailand more committed to uh, development. For example, OECD has a provision on anti-corruption, anti-bribery, which can commit Thailand and nudge Thailand into a more transparent society. So that's my hope. The first thing, join up with um, more developed countries. Join the OECD in particular. 
to make Thailand um, more sustainable and more dynamic. Secondly, work with ASEAN because we don't have high technology yet. But if we walk around the supermarket in ASEAN countries, which I have um, done quite a few times um, before COVID, I went to supermarket in Cambodia, in Laos, in Myanmar, the Philippines, Malaysia, and I have found that Thai products are quite popular among ASEAN consumers. This is where we are good at. So we have to work closely with ASEAN, use ASEAN as our production base, use ASEAN as our market, as ASEAN is growing faster than Thailand. It's difficult to grow 10% if you are a company um, existing solely in Thailand because the, Thai, the growth of Thailand is only 3% for the foreseeable future. But if we move to Laos, move to Cambodia, Vietnam, we can certainly grow at five, six, or even 10% because the growth rate in those countries are higher. So I think this is where foreign policy has to come in to help nudge the Thai development path into the, wrong dire into the right direction. So let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Frontier. I think you, you have uh, achieved your goal of being controversial. I think, uh, <laughs> I, I think there are a lot of uh, questions that uh, still we need uh, some answers. So um, I will give uh, each of the uh, panelists uh, time to react to whatever they have said, each other have said uh, in the first round. Uh, would Dr. Viratai have some prescription for our future, how, how we should go forward. Thank, thank you very much, um, Dr. Anuson. I would like to um, echo um, Dr. Sopawut and Dr. Somkiet on the priority policies that Thailand um, should look at. <clears throat> I think Dr. Sopawut started by, by giving um, a very important message that uh, the world forward, we, we have a world of uh, low growth and, and, and and um, with a high possibility of high inflation. And, and that will be very different from, from the past few decades. Um, so um, to be able to, to survive and succeed in, in that environment, it is very important that, that we need a new growth engine and we have to focus on, on, on in my view, on, um, on productivity. <laughs> Um, how to improve productivity, and we should focus on 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 the sectors that that are least productive relatively to to our competitors. We discuss a lot about the agricultural sector. Um, you know, it's it's a big sector in terms of the percentage of livelihood of the Thai population, but it's not a big sector as a percentage of GDP. But we want to to live up the standards of living of the the Thai public. Um, the productivity of the agricultural sector is, is, is key, as um, Dr. 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 Superwood has, has, has given some figures comparing Thailand and, and Japan. That's very clear. If you look at Thailand and, and, and our neighboring countries in terms of uh, view um, of, of the major crops, you will see exactly the same pattern. Um, the other sector that, um, that we all discuss upon is upon the energy usage. Um, the energy intensity of the Thai economy is very high, and, and, and that makes the Thai economy highly vulnerable to, to, um, to, to, to um, the, the global um, shortage in, of, of energy and, and volatility in energy prices. Um, the, the third sector, Dr. Samkia touched briefly, is education. We have to improve productivity of our education sector. And the last sector, in my view, that has very low productivity is public service, um, government uh, service. Uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I think that for the public service as a whole, um, the, the, the government is getting bigger, has, has become bigger and bigger um, during, during the past decade. Uh, and we have to move towards uh, lean public, public services. Uh, to, and if we can improve productivity in these four sectors, I think we will set Thailand into, in, in, into a new, new, new growth path. Uh, to, to be able to move uh, these, these 
productivity in these four sectors, uh, as an economist, I, I would focus uh, my, my first attention on, on creating the right incentives. Uh, to, you, know, you, you, can't, you can't create sustainable uh, change without providing the right incentive. We need an ecosystem that gives the right incentive. Um, by being more demand-driven, like Dr. Sumke said, um, in terms of education, uh, if we can move the educational um, subsidy or the way we provide educational <coughs> assistance to, to our public, that give a lot more weight to the demand, the demand side, meaning that you know, the, the parents, we have a lot more says in terms of selecting which schools they want to send their kids to, uh, to create uh, you know, competitions among schools um, that, that, that could improve productivity in education. But that's just only one, one example. Our energy is also very clear. We need to have the right incentives by providing subsidy on the use of diesels and, and LPG. Uh, in, in the current environment, um, it will create a lot of fiscal burden, fiscal pressure. But most importantly, it will not set um, the, the, the energy usage of the Thai economy in, in, in the right direction. If, if I'm not mistaken, the amount of energy consumption of Thailand has, has gone up during the past uh, 12 months quite significantly, despite the fact that the global prices has become much, much, much higher. And the economic activities have not resumed to the pre-COVID level yet. Uh, so during the past two years, I think energy intensity in, in Thailand has, has become even higher, which is not a good sign. Uh, we, we need to, to provide the right um, economic incentives to make sure that you know, all economic agents, being it firms, households, individuals, adjust their, 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 their behaviors in the right direction. And, and we're talking not only achieving the degree of energy intensity that our competitors are having now, but we have to think ahead in terms of the low carbon society, uh, which become even more, even more a bigger, uh, even a bigger, a bigger, a bigger, a bigger challenge. Um, so you know, productivity, we have to be key, and productivity in, in the relatively low productivity sectors, the four sectors I mentioned, should be at the top, at the top priority of, of the government. And the, the, uh, the other two, the, uh, the other two um, priorities that I would, I would like to focus on, one is on inclusivity. Um, you know, in the current stage of the world, I mean, we will see a lot more disparity, um, economic disparity and also disparity in access to opportunity, particularly because educational system is no longer a social ladder as it used to be in, in, in Thailand. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, during this transition period, you see large companies, large corporations gaining more market power while the, the small and medium-sized firms are losing their, 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 their competitiveness. So we see a lot more oligopolic, oligopolistic structure in, 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 key, in key sectors. Inclusivity, we have to be, to be, to be key in, 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 in economic policies. And, and the last one, um, being a central banker, as you know, we always emphasize on stability, and we can't achieve stability without good, having a good buffer. Immunity is very important, how to create economic immunity. I mean, the way we can deal with the short-term challenges is because of the immunity that we have on the external front, on the macro front, the, the soundness of the banking system, the capital adequacy of the banking system, the size of international reserves that we have. But if you look ahead, um, the government uh, budget, the current the current fiscal positions of, of the Thai government is, is relatively okay, um, but looking ahead, being a super-edged society and also with a lot of subsidies, a lot of distortions in economic policies, we could, we could be in, in a position of having fiscal, fiscal challenge in, in, in the future. So we need also need to think of build up, building up um, the, 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 the fiscal, uh, fiscal immunity. Um, the other sector that, that is having serious problems is, is the household. If you look at the amount of household debts in, in, in Thailand, um, you know, if you look at the macro level, household debt per GDP um, is, is, is quite high. It's one of the highest in the world in terms of the, when you compare with the countries with a similar stage of development, uh, Thailand has the highest household debts. But if you look into micro, micro granular data, it's even more concerning. Uh, Thai people starting becoming indebted at a very young age. 
and uh, the rate of becoming non-performing loans is also quite high. Uh, we did a study at the Bank of Thailand when, when it was at the bank. Um, it's, it's very frightening to see that the cohort of people at the age of 29 to 30 years old, uh, that cohort had the highest NPL ratio. And the NPL ratio was as high as, you know, um, as almost close to 20%. Um, so when we think about this cohort, there were people who have to build their families, build business, you know, build their life, but they could not survive, they could not service their loans, and, and, and they're on the blacklist of the credit bureau. Um, and also, if you look at the cohort that was about to retire, we, normally we would expect you know, people in the age of 55 to 60 to have some forms of savings so that they, would, they could survive post-retirement. Uh, but many Thais continue to have a large amount of debt at, at that age. So the, the household debt is very important. So when we talk about immunity, creating buffer, creating immunity, is not only at the macro level, it has also to, to go down to, to, um, to the household level. But that can only be done only when we increase the income of household. And that can only be done because we, through the increase in productivity, particularly labor productivity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Viratai. Uh, next, could I turn back to Dr. Zuhumud? Uh, any prescription you wish to uh, share with us? Um, not anything in particular, but an, an article caught my eye um, a few weeks ago, and I'd like to share this with you. It's an article written by a uh, team of scientists in uh, Chiang Mai University, uh, published in a magazine, I'm sorry, a journal called The Forest on the 19th of January 2022. It entitled Financial Analysis of Potential Carbon Value Over 14 Years of Forest Restoration by the Framework Species Method, which is probably, I think, uh, a UN standardized um, way to regrow forest and save on carbon emission. In other words, when you grow a forest, a proper one, um, it will store carbon in the soil, it will store carbon in the trees. And this group of Thai and, and foreign um, academics uh, calculated the uh, carbon storage from restoring a uh, piece of land to become a forest over 14 years. And then they priced it at the um, uh, price, uh, carbon price in Europe. As you know, Europe has the most active and the biggest uh, carbon trading market, the cap and trade is probably the, the biggest and probably will become a, a global standard going forward. I agree at the moment there's so many markets, so many prices. The European one is probably the highest, but the Europeans are very, I think, um, in the forefront on, on this uh, side of things. The, the reason I happened to look, find this article was that obviously I had been concerned about the uh, European community uh, implementing the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is supposed to come into effect starting, I think, next year where uh, we will start to have to record and, and provide data on the way uh, uh, we, we emit carbon. And then as time goes by, uh, products that are high in carbon usage, carbon emission, will have, to re will have to pay a particular tax to ensure that carbon doesn't leak from the European system. I think that's it. So this article um, went and did this calculation a very, again, a very uh, interesting comment because they, they went and looked at how if they had to borrow money from the Bank for Agriculture and Cooperatives, if they had to use labor and you have to use uh, qualified personnel, they have to grow the forest and they calculated and they do a discount rate and they calculated the NPV, the net uh, present value of growing a forest in Chiang Mai. Over 14 years profit, uh, NPV, would amount to 22 thousand two hundred and fifteen dollars to twenty five thousand two hundred and fifty seven uh, dollars per hectare and you would get a break even in just four years or maybe just seven years depending on the variant uh, varying the cost but the return is based on the carbon price uh, in the Euro European market at, at, a t at that time about sixty dollars per ton equivalent now, then they compare that to profit for maize cultivation. And profit for maize cultivation was only 
$1,347.53 per hectare over 14 years. I think, for example, uh, uh, something that looks interesting to me is how can we trade our carbon in the European market? Would be an in intriguing, I think, thing to do going forward. That would obviously, according to the, um, to, to the authors here, improve our uh, soil, improve our climate condition, reduce forest fires, and so on and so forth. And of course, it means huge return to, to, to Thai uh, farmers, because you're getting $22,000 instead of $1,300 over 14 years. And that was based on the carbon price at the time being $60. Today, it's about 90. And it's supposed to go to about 110, according to IMF and World Bank, because that is the price that they think is needed to make sure that the world actually emits less carbon to get to, you know, see, um, um, to get to our uh, targets for 2030 and 2050. So I leave that, I think, you know, as something to think about. When you talk about uh, BCG and so on, um, I think I want to be more concrete. I want to be more concrete like this. Uh, I think all we have to do here is to price carbon the way that the uh, uh, Europeans price the carbon. Apparently, uh, the, the price of carbon in Thailand is too cheap today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subhut. Uh, I think at TDI, you have done a lot of work on uh, the BCG. Would you like to share something with us further, Dr. Subhut? Thank you. It's always easy to be the third and the last speaker. You just come by the previous two speakers and add on something, and that's going to be my formula to use today. Um, so I, I totally agree with Dr. Viratai that uh, providing the right incentives would be a good thing. And Dr. Superwood uh, mentioned that um, the, the carbon offset uh, market potential for Thailand. And I think um, to do that, and, and the Thai government, as you know, has already pressed to achieve carbon neutrality um, by the year um, 2050 and uh, net zero by 2065, something like that, right? Um, apparently, the Thai government uh, announced that, um, as far as I, 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 I know, I have a, a Dr. Narung Chai and myself had a seminar with uh, some of Thai uh, policy makers um, last week, and um, we found that the Thai government haven't decided yet and, and doesn't have a clue yet whether to impose a carbon tax uh, in Thailand or having a cap and trade kind of system. Uh, they, 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 they look at me when I ask them the question, do we really need that? So <laughs> that's, a, that's the thing I'm, I'm shocked. Um, they believe that you know, by promoting EV and by promoting renewable energy, the carbon question of Thailand will be solved. So it's not only that we have um, zero carbon price, we already have negative carbon price because the government subsidized diesel um, fuel um, pretty much um, than the cleaner energy. So getting the incentive right is really important. Totally agree with um, um, Dr. Viratai. And I would like to add two more things. Um, certainly um, getting the incentive right. And secondly um, would be decentralizing uh, the public sector. Um, Public sector, as Dr. Wiedertai mentioned, I totally agree, is the hardest nut to crack, and it has to be cracked. Otherwise, Thailand will not be able to move forward. And one way to crack that is to decentralize and giving more autonomy to local government. I think the Thai people have very really high hope in the new governor of Bangkok, which happened to be a classmate of mine during high school time. Um, I think people voted him um, enormously because they believe that by having strong local government over, over, um, overseeing a, a city would be a better idea. And I think the optimism is still here. So if we would like to change the whole central government, that would be a really tough. But I think we can decentralize, we can decentralize and giving uh, autonomy to the local administrative bodies and that we can make huge progress by that. And my last point would be, my, my last prescription, um, apart from giving the right incentive, 
um, decentralizing and giving more autonomy is to improve capability of the Thai people. Um, we discuss about factor of production, people, um, machinery, um, capital, and technology. The right incentive um, for Thailand is to promote investment in um, capability enhancing uh, companies. So far, we have used the mecha mechanism of the BOI to attract investment in a number of sectors, for example, car production, electronic production, um, and many other things. I think it's now the time to attract, especially the types of company that will promote uh, more capability of the Thai people. For example, attract some vocational school, vocational colleges that can train better uh, technicians for Thailand. Attract companies that can provide more automation, help Thai companies automate themselves. Attract companies that will help Thai companies to be more energy efficient. Attract companies that can help Thai companies to be more um, um, carbon efficient. And by that, Thailand can move to the next stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think um, with two rounds uh, of the, uh, our panelists, uh, I will open the floor. Oh, Dr. Nelson, if, if, if I may, yes, given that um, Dr. Superwood and Dr. Samjet have touched on the issues of, of carbon credit, um, just want to, to, um, to, to um, mention, mention a few things. Um, for foreign direct investment going forward, we have to look at uh, the, um, the commitments towards net zero for the companies, that, particularly the, the multinational corporations, um, the commitments that they have already pledged, and also the country that they have invested in. Um, and really think in terms of the COP26 language is you know, the three scopes that we have to achieve net zero. Um, just one thing that I want to highlight in, 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 for the case of Thailand as compared to other countries in the regions, I think we have high potential to be, to be a carbon sink, to be a good carbon sink. And, and also looking at the scope two, um, the source of electricity used in production uh, the electricity generated in Thailand tends to be cleaner or cleaner than electricity produced in other countries in the regions because we depend very little on coal. We depend a lot on, 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 on hydro um, energies and also on, on gas, which tend to be cleaner by other countries in, 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 in the regions. They continue to depend a lot on, 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 on coal power plants. And, and we think in terms of offsetting, that we think in terms of how, how to offset you know, the, the carbon footprint. Obviously, we have, we have, we have um, the, the government, particularly the, the current minister of environment is very active on reforestation to, to, to provide carbon sink in the forest. And I'll come back to this in, in a minute. The other one is the Gulf of Thailand has a good potential to be a carbon storage. Um, you know, a lot of exploration has taken gas out of the Gulf of Thailand, and you see the large gas company exploration productions are now moving in terms of uh, getting the carbon, liquidified carbon, back into, into, in, into the underground storage. And so that has a high potential. So in terms of, in terms of um, carbon sink, reducing carbon footprint, I think Thailand has, has a good potential as compared to other countries in the regions, but that doesn't solve the problems of, of carbon, uh, of energy efficiency. We continue to step up our effort significantly on, on energy efficiency. Let me come back to the issues about generating carbon credit from reforesta reforestation. One hat that I'm, I'm wearing now, I serve as a Secretary General of Mae Fa Luong Foundation. Uh, Mae Fa Luong Foundation, as some of you might know, in the form of Doi Tung, that's, that's a brand of our, our, our products. Um, we're celebrating 50 years anniversary this year, and we have a large area of sustainable development in, in Chiang Rai called uh, Doi Tung. And in that area, we, we started um, to compile uh, the ESG principle by focusing on the E and the S. Uh, the Mae Fa Luong Foundation was founded by, by Princess Mother, uh, of, of, of the late King Rama the Ninth. 
and, and the princess mother always set the policies that you know, you, we have to grow forests at the same time as growing people. You can't grow forests without growing people, and that has been the, the, the core principle of the foundation. So, so we, we do reforestation to gener generate carbon credit that will go back to the people in the villages. Okay. We serve as a bridge, basically, and we do a lot of um, auditing process for them, um, technical ad advice for them, and also try to market the carbon credit for them. But the revenue will go back to to the local to the local people, and, and we we did uh, 50,000 rides of community forest last year. We are also doing another 50,000 rides of community forest this year, and we also have about 300,000 rides of the Doi Tung area that, that that we protect. We generate carbon credit on, on a long term basis. This will be cash cow for for the local people. So I agree with Dr. Support. There is a huge potential, and, and this is a way that we can Thailand can can showcase you know this this. This model of um, of of E and S, you know, environmental and sustain environmental and socially sustainable uh, community development, and you, you can't solve the problems of 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 climate change without dealing with the community. Um, we have to go back and deal with the community to be able to have a sustainable model. The director general of Taika brought a group um, to to visit us last uh, two months ago. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to organize you know, groups in case the members of the diplomatic corps are interested to visit Taito. We'd be delighted to, to showcase our, our, our model. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if no more, for, for the moment, if, if uh, uh, panelists uh, will agree, I will uh, allow the, from the floor. Dr. Rong Chai, please. Thank you, thank you. I made the point of coming here uh, to this occasion, this IAC uh, opening. I'd like to draw your attention to the first uh, word uh, on, on the recovery. I think what we have been hearing is mostly about development. Uh, I, I'd like to say a little bit about recovery. And this recovery depends so much on what's happening in Thailand in Q4 2022 and Q1 2023. Now for Q4 2022, we have fantastic opportunities happening because a lot of uh, trade fairs and exhibitions uh, are moving to Thailand. This is the winter uh, end of the year functions. All Hong Kong facilities, all Hong Kong functions are moving to Thailand for exhibition and for, so we have lots of opportunities in other areas as well. But that's a lot depends on how foreign affairs is managing Q4. So for Q4 Thailand, most important ministry is foreign affairs. How you manage EPEC. You know, if EPEC is managed smoothly, uh, it will do a lot of great things to Thailand. And that's a big challenge. Because the, we are in a situation where we have two prime ministers. One is I call off-duty Prime Minister, another is on-duty Prime Minister. Uh, by next month, when you are ready for EPEC for November, we may have decision about one of them. But whichever of them, there will be chaos. You know, if the off-duty Prime Minister is put back to be Prime Minister, chaos. If the uh, on-duty prime minister is no longer prime minister or on-duty chaos, in a way it is similar to what happened in uh, the end of 2008 and beginning of 2009 when Thailand was a host for ASEAN summit. And there was a change of government from Thaksin through Samak, through Somchai to Abhisit. And Abhisit was hosting um, ASEAN summit in Pattaya with all the leaders that was so chaotic it was so chaotic you know so I'm hoping I'm hoping that foreign affairs can manage this fourth quarter well and I think you need help from all the embassies sitting here I don't know how many uh, embassies uh, epic embassies are sitting in this room so I hope you can help you know calm down all your leaders coming here you know, don't be too excited about what's going on. 
last time it was big damage to Thailand. You know, the the leaders from all over the, from the, all the country joining us, really complaining. So this is the the fourth quarter. Now, first quarter 2022, a lot depends on the financial management, because I believe that uh, there would be uh, finance problems in the world, as some of the speakers already mentioned, and the energy problems. There is an energy reconfiguration going on at the moment. Those are two areas that will be chaotic, and we need good management from, from finance and uh, also from energy in order to really achieve the recovery. Then we can talk about development. If we can go through this recovery well, if we can manage this recovery, maybe it's easier to, to get into the subjects of development, which I think all the three speakers have already mentioned the key factors. And that we can work on pretty well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Wong Chai. Uh, who else would like to um Ask questions or share your you know, views, perspectives on these questions. We have a lot of we have a lot of uh, people from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here. Uh, please raise your hand. Anybody would like to? Thank you. You want to say something? Okay. Professor Quick from Malaysia. Um, thanks very much, uh, Director Anuson, and thanks so much for all three uh, panelists for your very insightful uh, presentations. If I may uh, ask two uh, quick questions, one uh, politics and uh, one economics to uh, all three panelists. Uh, the first question, uh, it's, uh, I think all three uh, panelists early on uh, in your presentations, uh, you have all highlighted the various form of disruptions uh, for post-COVID uh, recovery of Thailand also a regional context. And uh, one of those uh, disruptors uh, clearly is about the geopolitical uh, disruption. And I think uh, Dr. Spovut, uh, you were the one who mentioned about US-China decoupling. And uh, you mentioned about the uh, supply chain uh, semiconductor chips. But you also mentioned very briefly without elaborating uh, about there are other sectors as well. So if uh, we can invite the uh, Dr. Actually, uh, Som Kiat's uh, uh, approach. Earlier on, you mentioned about politics uh, way of uh, thinking is about on the one hand, on the other hand. So maybe we can invite panelists to elaborate. On the one hand, uh, how US-China rivalry, especially the coupling, uh, benefit Thailand? And on the other hand, uh, how, uh, in what way, you are worried about the implication uh, uh, for Thailand and also uh, regional countries? And the uh, uh, economic issue is a relatively shorter one. I think that's about connectivity. I think connectivity clearly is central to uh, economic recovery. And uh, this is what Thailand has been uh, famous of. I do have a specific question about a specific and uh, transboundary uh, connectivity, regional connectivity that Tha Thailand has been uh, attracting lots of attention. That is about the real connectivity. Uh, and Thailand has been positioned itself to connect northwards Lao China Railroad and then uh, southward uh, to uh, Malaysia and also uh, Singapore. But looking from Malaysia, we are a bit puzzled by some paradoxical uh, Thailand's uh, connectivity role. In the sense that on the one hand, I think uh, we see that uh, the phase one, phase two of uh, um, Bangkok, Korat, Korat, uh, Nong Kai have been growing very slowly. But why uh, the enthusiastic and very active uh, role in promoting the transboundary connectivity in terms of uh, I'll stop here. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Who would like to start? Uh, Dr. Subhir, please. Somehow Dr. Superwood has um, directed to me that uh, I should speak first. Um, <laughs> um, it's really interesting questions. Um, on the one hand, I think the US and China conflict um, is beneficial to Southeast Asian countries, including Thailand, um, by forcing multinational companies uh, in China to relocate in this region, which is uh, one of few um, production hubs of the world. So Vietnam get the most of the benefit, followed by um, probably Thailand, Indonesia, and then probably Malaysia. Um, that's on the one hand, on the plus side. On the other hand, um, on, on, the, on, on the one hand, we get higher share of the pie. On the other hand, the pie shrinks when the two superpower 
are in conflict because of trade war, um, the global economy certainly grow slower. So that's uh, the plus and the minus side of this uh, conflict. And we need to avoid um, choosing the side. And I think ASEAN leaders have, opinion leaders have already made up their mind more or less. I would like to refer to uh, a survey by ISIS, a think tank in uh, Singapore. Um, they have asked questions. If ASEAN countries have to choose side during the conflict between the US and China, uh, which side would you choose? And the answer is really interesting. The majority of ASEAN countries, nearly 50%, choose we have to unite ASEAN. <laughs> Basically, we are not choosing side. Second choice, they said explicitly, we are not going to choose side. <laughs> third choice, if we are forced to choose side, we choose the third side, <laughs> which is probably Japan or Australia. <laughs> and lastly, if all the alternatives run out, well, we have to choose side. <laughs> and they choose United States at a, a kind of 10 percentage point margin over China. Um, they believe that China is more powerful economically and politically in the region, but they choose um, U.S. over China. This is the opinion leader um, in, in uh, ASEAN region. Um, the survey was conducted uh, late last year. And another really interesting question, in respect, in respect, in regard, regardless of politics, which country would you like to go and travel? It's not the US, it's not China, it's Japan. Japan is number one. Unfortunately, Japan is not really open for tourism, for Thai tourists now. So that's my uh, response. Um, and the second question about high-speed rail. Well, we have a paradox here. We have a high-speed rail at a low-speed construction. <laughs> so it will take some time. Um, as far as I know, it's only um, the achievement so far is only about three or four percent of um, of the milestone to complete the um, Bangkok Korat Nakhon link. Uh, the problem, I believe, is related to a reclamation of the land. Um, and um, apart from that, we, we have to uh, connect Nakhon uh, Ratchasima and Nong Kai to connect with the uh, China and um, uh, Laos um, high-speed rail network, and there will be a lot of challenges. First of all, the gauge of the rail, the railroad is not compatible. The Chinese uh, Lao high-speed rail link um, use standard gauge, a kind of uh, one and a half meter um, wide, um, but the Thai side is a one meter gate, which is narrower, so there will be some challenges. The train cannot just run through. Secondly, there's rumors which has not been confirmed yet about the size of the container used by Chinese um, rails, whether it would be Chinese specific standard or is it uh, standard uh, container. If it's not the same, then there will be a lot of interesting and a lot of, there will be a lot of challenging uh, tasks to move not only the train. If you cannot move the train because the gauge is not the same, you have to move the container but what if the container size is not the same again? Well, interesting. Let's see what happened. Um, I, I would not be able to answer about the high-speed rail and low, uh, slow construction side. I think that's uh, very complex, uh, and I, I don't have any, pub, any data on that. But in terms of the geopolitical risk, I, I have to be very blunt and, and say that what I didn't mention was, of course, Taiwan. I think that um, Taiwan has um, is so much uh, inter uh, has so much significance politically and strategically for the U.S. and for China. Um, and number two, if uh, China can in fact um, take over Taiwan, then I, I think it will probably displace the U.S. from the A Asia Pacific region in a in a serious way. Um, and finally, uh, Taiwan. Um, Looking at my data, it's, a, it's a, um, an interesting uh, island in the sense that it's a very small, relatively small, 25 million people. 95% um, of their energy is imported. 
and of that, 97% is fossil fuel. So in other words, they can't um, transport the energy by air. They'll have to transport it by sea. Now, if you would think, if, if you look at the, um, the, 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 what, what happened with the Chinese war games, they basically surrounded Taiwan and they couldn't get the energy in, I'm sure, if, if that became a more uh, aggressive stance from China. Yet at the same time, Taiwan's market share of semiconductors is 63% of global semiconductors. TSMC alone, 54%. Now, I'm not saying that if uh, China were to take over Taiwan and, and TSMC, then the Chinese will have all the semiconductors they want, but certainly they can uh, increase their leverage on the semiconductor side of things, whereas the U.S. at the moment is putting pressure on them right now with, um, uh, with restrictions on uh, NVIDIA and other things. So to me, the biggest geopolitical risk for this region in the next 10, 20 years is probably how uh, Taiwan status is resolved. Um, and I would hope that it is resolved very peacefully. Thank you. Dr. Vera Thai, please. Um, Dr. Superwood mentioned about um, energy fix for Taiwan should the geopolitics, geopolitical developments uh, turn sour. I like to bring um, this similar issue closer to home and also following Dr. Narong Chai's uh, remarks about the first quarter of next year when we have to deal with global energy crisis. Um, obviously, you know, being a small country, having good multidimensional relationships with the two giants, we don't want to be in a position to select side. Uh, and that's, that's, that's very important for Thailand. That's very important for ASEAN. Um, Speaking at the ISC with members of the diplomatic corps, we, I would also like to, to bring up this issue. We would also like the members of the diplomatic corps to also understand that um, why we don't want to shoot side. We also don't want to be pushed into a position to shoot side. And, and um, the issue that is, that is very pertinent to Thailand is the energy from Myanmar. Uh, we depend on Myanmar gas um, about to feed in about 17% of our, our total gas and energy productions for electricity in Thailand. That's substantial, about 17%. Uh, Myanmar exports gas to two countries, China and, and Thailand. And when the EU imposed sanctions on oil and gas of Myanmar and Total had to pull out, it was unavoidable for the PTT group Thailand to go in and, and, and take over the operatorship of Yadana gas field. Otherwise, Thailand would run out of gas and we would run out of, we would not have enough electricity. And also the Myanmar people, we also not have, not have electricity. So we're in a very, very uh, delicate position. We understand uh, where you know, the, the European Union countries were coming from. We understand you know, the other countries are the stands on, on, on Myanmar diplomacy, but, but given the, the, the energy dependence of Thailand on Myanmar, I think this, this is a major, mm -hmm. ma major risk. And, and we all know that there have been a lot of pressure, political pressure in many capitals, asking that governments to impose sanctions on Myanmar, oil and gas. Okay. Um, we would very much like to work with you know, the, the different uh, governments, the different embassies, to find ways to mitigate the impact on Thailand. If such a sanction is imposed without good preparation, it could create significant economic damage to the Thai economy. Uh, we won't be able to get enough LNG, enough diesel to come in to run our, 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 power, our power plants. And, and as Dr. Nguyen Chai has already painted, the winter of this year, the, the world is, is going to face with global energy crisis. Um, you know, this is, this is a very delicate balance uh, for the short term. And if you look in terms of the medium to long term, uh, should a strict sanction be, be imposed on Myanmar oil and gas? And if Thailand falls into a position that we would have to stop operations in Myanmar and pull out of Myanmar, who is going to come in? Because Myanmar will continue to, to require gas operations to, to generate electricity inside Myanmar. Okay. 
obviously the other side will come in and take over operatorship. And, and that will change you know, energy security in the region. That will change geopolitical dynamics in, in the region. Uh, Thailand being an energy importing country, and as you know, we import a lot of, of hydro, um, you know, um, from the hydro power, electricity from hydro power plants in Laos, which also depends on the water coming from China. And also we import a lot of gas from, from, from Myanmar. And should that equation change? You know, changing the control of operatorship in, in Myanmar, that will also change geopolitical situation in the region. So you know, that's, that's, that, that's a risk factor in the short term and also for the medium to long term. And this is an example of, of you know, asking um, you know, the, the, the understanding from our very good friends, you know, particularly the, 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 the major countries, to understand uh, where we stand, to understand our risks, to understand our threats, and, and so that we're not in a position to be pushed to select side. And that's, that's, that's very critical. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we still have a, a few more minutes, so uh, there's one more question. If um, good afternoon. I am Pai Lin from Gazesat University. Uh, I am a teacher, okay? So what I want to know is about um, the labor, actually, because like, I kind of like have to prepare my students to get into the labor market after that gradu graduation. So what I would like to ask, because like um, we talk about the uh, challenge, international, international challenge, we talk about domestic uh, limitation and everything, but I want to know like uh, in the perspective of economists, what kind of labor or what the qualification of labor do you want in order to have like sustainable development? The reason why I ask this question because Two or three days ago, I asked my students like what they want to do after they, they graduate, you know. And I think many percent said like, "Oh, I want to have passive income." Like you don't have uh, hello, you don't have active income yet. Okay, so so um, I, I said, but but then some of them like already had a Facebook shop already, you know, like uh, they have a very entrepreneur entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit already. So I would like to know like what. What kind, what um, qualification of labor that they should have, and what Thai education should equip them with? Thank you. Who would like to answer that? Dr. Song Kiet, please. Um, as as I cover a bit on education reform, um, this is usually the standard answer that I give to um, this kind of question. I think um, we are shifting from so-called hard skill skill in in certain subjects matters, for example, um, um, biology, science, and, and mathematics to so-called soft skill. And the soft skill that are important uh, for the future are called the ASK model. A is attitude, S is skill, and K is knowledge. So knowledge is, or, or the hard skill become the last. Uh, you have to begin with attitude and then uh, build some skill and then attain some knowledge. Uh, skills that are important for the VUCA world that Dr. Uh, Viratai has mentioned, since the world is really uncertain, it can change really quickly, it's becoming uncertain and really complex. Um, we, ne we need to have um, graduates who, are, um, who have growth mindset in the sense that they believe that even though they cannot do something today, uh, if they try hard enough, they can do that tomorrow, for example. Um, another is that and also related is open-mindedness because the world cannot be fixed in advance. You have to have open mind to adapt for the change. Thirdly, um, curiosity is also very important. Um, since um, the world is changing, we have to be curious and at the same time have to have critical mind um, to ask, how do you know that? For example, there are so many things happening and we would like to um, have students who have critical minds. Um, lastly, uh, and this is um, also um, related to the topic that we are discussing today about um, global affairs. So they have to be cosmopolitan. They have to understand the world. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's someone. Ah, yes. Okay. Kapun Krap. My name is Akra Pongen. I was trained as a lawyer, so I don't know much about politics nor economics, but my question will be about law. Here in Thailand, what laws and legal 
infrastructure do you think that we need to be, that needs to be improved to make our country sustainable, to recover our economies and to develop? Thank you. Uh, who would take that? I thought that's okay, please. Probably um, we don't need, uh, well, well, certainly we need some substantive laws in certain areas. For example, we would like to, to levy a carbon tax on, on human activities. We need to pass that kind of law. But I would argue that we will need a rule of law in Thailand, legal certainty, predictability, unbiased um, law enforcement, as we have seen for many cases. Um, and the very recent one, I don't know whether you have followed a very dramatic um, news about one uh, female soldier, one female, one female uh, police, police woman, right? And have uh, abuse another female um, soldier and have abuse, um, you know, have um, extracted some, some benefits from stationing in the deep south without really stationing there and many so so other, many so uh, so so very complex issue and, and you know this is the bad the the very bad part of, of Thailand that we have to get rid of. Establish the rule of law and the law will enforce itself. Okay, I, I think that's very clear. Our last question please Ambassador. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, firstly, for this excellent panel. My name is David Daly. I'm the ambassador of the European Union. Um, since the European Union was mentioned on a number of occasions uh, by the panelists, I would like to uh, make a, an important point that um, you mentioned difficult, complex issues, climate change, carbon tax, uh, the FTA, even uh, sanctions on Myanmar, uh, which incidentally only apply to EU companies and, and not to Thai companies. There's no, no extraterritoriality. But the point I want to make is we do need to talk more, the EU and Thailand. And here, a word of congratulations, mutual congratulations to the Thai negotiators and to the EU negotiators for having initialed on Friday last in Brussels the new partnership and cooperation agreement, which will make it more structured, more regular, and a more comprehensive dialogue between Thailand and the European Union. And all of these sorts of issues, which are important and complex, they need that type of dialogue. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I think um, our time is up, uh, it's 3.30, and uh, I would like to uh, express my great uh, admiration and uh, appreciation to all our three uh, panelists for very clear and um, forward-looking uh, presentations and answers. So uh, please give them a round of applause, please.